This is judicial activism at its finest. We'll report more on this tomorrow, and I'll also do it on radio. Now, Shannon Bream and the Fox News at Night team are up to take it from here. Miss Shannon. Yeah, we're going to pick up on that new court ruling as well, Laura. Thank you very much. Here's what else we have coming up tonight. Deadly Dossier, a lawyer for one of the founders of the firm behind the so-called Dirty Dossier, claims someone was killed because of its publication, while lawmakers continue fighting for answers. The Attorney General and the FBI Director, and they won't give us straight answers. We may need the President of the United States to declassify this information. Plus, a top Senate Democrat releases closed-door testimony from one of the founders of Fusion GPS, the firm that helped produce the dossier. As Republicans raise new questions about leaks from inside the agencies now investigating and this should be a bipartisan bill this should be a bill of love president trump brings democrats to the table over immigration we'll talk to congresswoman martha mcsally who was inside that white house meeting and steve bannon leaves breitbart for his fire and fury quotes a colossal miscalculation we'll debate Welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. New tonight on the investigation into suspected Russian interference in the 2016 election. The top Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee unilaterally releasing the nearly 300-page transcript of the interview with Fusion GPS co-founder Glenn Simpson. Fusion GPS is the research firm that commissioned the so-called dirty dossier about alleged activity in Russia by Donald Trump or associates of his before he was president. In that interview, Simpson details meeting with Russian lawyer Natalia Veselnitskaya as far back as 2014, a lawyer known to have close ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin, and the same lawyer who held that infamous meeting with Donald Trump Jr. at Trump Tower, ostensibly to discuss dirt on Hillary Clinton. Simpson was asked in the Senate interview whether Fusion has ever been paid by that Russian lawyer. His answer, yes, but I don't think the money came from her. Meanwhile, President Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen, is filing a pair of defamation lawsuits tonight, one in New York State court against the website BuzzFeed and the other in federal court against Fusion GPS. The lawsuits paint a picture of alleged Russian collaboration with Fusion GPS and alleged Fusion GPS collaboration with Democrats and the Republican Party. Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry joins us now with all these late-breaking developments. Good evening, Ed. Shannon, that's right. Breaking this hour, President Trump and his legal team striking back at what his allies call that dirty dossier that was unverified. And now they say defamatory as well. The president's longtime attorney and friend, Michael Cohn, tweeting just a few moments ago that, quote, enough is enough. He's filed a federal suit against Fusion GPS and that co-founder, Glenn Simpson, plus, as you noted, a state suit in New York against BuzzFeed for publishing parts of the dossier. Officials at the website tonight insist it was in the public interest to publish it, and they will aggressively defend their First Amendment rights. Simpson already under scrutiny after Dianne Feinstein did release more than 300 pages of his private testimony last summer to the Senate Judiciary Panel. Feinstein trying to justify that by claiming Republicans are beating up on fusion to distract from the Russian collusion story, except allies of the president tonight say there's no evidence of collusion, and this transcript actually raises new questions about fusion and its allies, like former British spy Christopher Seal. He helped gather this unverified dirt on the president. Last week, Republican Charles Grassley sent a criminal referral for Steele to the Justice Department, suggesting he lied to federal officials. In his testimony, Simpson, meanwhile, said Steele went to the FBI in July 2016, the same month that the FBI started its Russia probe, and suggested the FBI had a human source inside Trump world to back up some of the claims in the dossier. Simpson testifying the FBI believed Chris's information might be credible because they had other intel that indicated the same thing, and one of those pieces of intel was a human source from inside the Trump organization. Except tonight, Simpson is backpedaling. A source close to him telling the Hill newspaper he misspoke about the FBI and Steele and that it was just Trump campaign official George Papadopoulos meeting with an Australian ambassador. Big difference. Simpson's lawyer testified that at least one person wound up dead when some media organizations published that information from the dossier. The lawyer saying, quote, Simpson wants to be very careful to protect his sources. 
Somebody's already been killed as a result of the publication of this dossier, and no harm should come to anybody related to this honest work. That puts more pressure on the media organizations who publish this information and explains why FBI Director Christopher Wray has been very cautious. House Intelligence Committee has requested documents from you and other government officials from the so-called Steele dossier. Why have you failed to produce these documents? In many instances, we are dealing with very, very dicey questions of sources and methods, which is the lifeblood of foreign intelligence and for our liaison relationships with our foreign partners. Now, Simpson and a colleague recently wrote a New York Times op-ed headline, The Republicans' Fake Investigations, saying that they were all about transparency, yet this new transcript shows Simpson declined to answer questions about how Fusion was paid. In the months since last summer's testimony, Republicans have gotten their hands on bank records showing Hillary Clinton's presidential camp and the DNC paid for some of this dirt through Democratic attorney Mark Elias. Yet when Simpson was pressed on whether Fusion GPS was a Democratic link firmed, he responded he would not agree with that description. Shannon? All right, Ed Henry with the very latest live for us tonight. Thank Good you, Ed. And this is a Fox News alert on the so-called Dreamer program for those hundreds of thousands of young immigrants whose legal status right now is up in the air. The Trump administration suspended the DACA program last September, gave lawmakers until March to try to sort out their status. It was what they were negotiating over at the White House today. Now tonight, just minutes ago, we get from a federal judge in San Francisco weighing in now with a pretrial injunction. The judge ruling that the DACA program, remember this was done by executive order under the Obama administration, it must remain in place while litigation over President Trump's decision to rescind the DACA program now works its way through the court. So as part of the ruling, the judge says the government does not have to process new DACA applications for people who had never before received the protection under the program. But for now, it stops the president from doing what he was going to do come March if they hadn't worked something out. So interesting that on the day they're negotiating this at the White House, a San Francisco federal judge uh, jumps in with this ruling. We'll have more on that as we get through that and get it to you as soon as possible. And in case you missed it, an extraordinary bit of television today involving the president and key members of both parties debating what to do about illegal immigration. Reaction tonight to what's been called an extraordinary move is extraordinary itself, with praise and criticism coming from quarters you normally wouldn't expect to see with this president. Peter Ducey is here with more on how this attempt at bipartisanship is going down with the, ref, the left, right, and the media. Peter? Shannon, nobody really knew what kind of progress Democrats and Republicans had been making on a DACA deal behind closed doors, but now we know because President Trump opened up the doors. Now, you have put it up there that uh, that you want $18 billion for a wall or else there will be no DACA. Is that still your position? Yeah, I can build it for less, by the way. It went on like that for 55 minutes, and the president's command of immigration policy from start to finish appeared to quiet some of his critics in the chattering class. This is a president who I think is pointedly behaving not as Michael Wolff would have him uh, portrayed in his book, but as somebody who is sitting around exactly. with people and is in charge here. But some of the president's other critics are upset now because they feel a DACA deal is being rushed to avoid a government shutdown. Jen Rubin in the Washington Post writes, quote, if Republicans are going to continue to play a cruel game with the lives of hundreds of thousands of immigrants, the Democrats shouldn't give them their votes to make up for defections from hardline Freedom Caucus members who resist funding the government under any realistic scenario. Conservative immigration hawks also upset tonight that the president indicated the border wall doesn't have to be 2,000 miles long because it would ha be hard to build anything on top of a river or a mountain that covers parts of the border with Mexico. When Kevin McCarthy is the hardliner on immigration in the room, I think we can call this the lowest day in the Trump presidency. I mean, he was clearly trying to um, overcome the bad press of this Michael Wolff book by showing, oh, he's in command. But in fact, what he did was fulfill every description of him in the Michael Wolff book. This was just a negotiation, though, early stages, and the president says he wants two phases of immigration fixes. First, DACA and the border wall, and then a comprehensive look at things like chain migration and visa overstays. Shannon? All right, Peter Ducey live for us tonight in Washington. Thank you very much. President Trump said in that meeting, quote, I'll take the heat. 
Now, perhaps he's responding to some of that on uh, Twitter tonight from his critics on the right. President Trump tweeting this, as I made very clear today, our country needs the security of the wall on the southern border, which must be part of any DACA approval. And it's worth rolling this sound by where he basically told Democrats, uh, you got to make a deal. But you're going to negotiate. I think you're going to negotiate. And maybe we'll agree and maybe we won't. I mean, you know, it's possible we're not going to agree with you and it's possible we are. But there should be no reason for us not to get this done. They're wearing matching outfits. No. The Star Walt, did you notice no. that? Our Fox News politics editor, they were wearing ma matching outfits. So it's adorbs. They weren't in Zapatico, though, on the subject matter of this. It was interesting, though. I have to wonder, did all of the Democrats and or the Republicans know that he was going to keep those cameras in there the whole time to watch him do what he likes to do, which is to no negotiate, be a businessman, be in charge of this meeting, to the point where, as Peter noted, um, Gloria Borger on CNN today had to say, I think this is a president who's pointedly behaving not as Michael Wolff would have him portrayed in his book, but as someone who's sitting around at the table and taking charge. Well, uh, uh, you and I talked about uh, last week that in light of the allegations and what was reported in the book, and by the way, what was sort of the received wisdom about Donald Trump was that he was not a vital part of his own administration. He needed to do something to demonstrate in real terms that he was and did. And for almost an hour today, against the toughest audience you can have, not just the press, but also Democrats sitting around at that table. He showed not just command, as you say, but also fluency in these issues, that he was able to talk about what was going on, that he had command of these subjects. Now, obviously, there was some parsing of the things that he said by people who liked this and didn't like that, but the takeaway was pretty clear. Whatever the people around that table could come up with for a deal, he was going to sign, uh, and that was that, and it was, it was pretty impressive. Well, it's interesting because not long before I came out here, I was watching another network, as we all do, to see what everyone's up to. We got to do it. Bad. I mean, I may got to check on them. Uh, and they interpreted this meeting completely differently. They really? said it proved that he had no command of the policy, that he had no idea where Republicans or Democrats stood on anything, and that he was completely clueless. I, I tell you what, I took away from that when the president basically said, we can do this in two parts. We can do mm -hmm. the DACA. We can do basically a one for one on the, these dreamers and then do comprehensive. Another thing you and I have talked about several times, and this would not please Ann Coulter, this would not please some others who make a living off of talking about immigration. For this issue, Donald Trump may be better situated to solve this problem for America than anybody else. He may be the only person, this has been a horrible issue for this country since George W. Bush tried to take it on. Ronald Reagan successfully dealt with it in the 80s. It's been a huge issue since 07. It's been a disaster for more than a decade now. Trump may be the only guy that can take it on, and he might have shown a little bit of that today. Okay, so let's talk about Ann Coulter and some others who weren't really thrilled with what they saw today. Let's start with uh, Congressman Steve King. Um, no surprise there that he is very anti-illegal immigration. He doesn't like the idea of amnesty, and he's worried that's what this is. Here's what he said. I'll submit this, and, and that DACA amnesty will cost American taxpayers and our economy far more than it'll cost to build a wall. And I hope that is in the record and stays in the record, and I won't have to wait very long to defend that statement, and a lot of people in the country are going to have to admit I'm right. Okay, he called it DACA amnesty. This is the tweet we got from Ann Coulter. She said, as he considers the utility of walls and promises, at real Donald Trump should consider that never Trump was toothless, but former Trump will bite. Yeah, the problem ultimately for these folks is Donald Trump flipped the Republican Party. He took a minority standing within the GOP into the, the full win because it was a divided field in 2016. But the plurality of the Republican Party, as well as the overwhelming majority of the country in, in its entirety, supports things like amnesty for these DACA people. Now They don't want to call it that, though. We're not talking about a full path to citizenship. Maybe letting them stay here to work and to I, do other things, I, serve in the military. I think if you took a but, plebiscite on it, people who were brought to the United States, is my, it's sort of like with these El Salvadorans that are in the United States, mm -hmm. have been here since 2001 that you talked about last night. You know, look, there's not a lot of appetite in America for taking people who have been here for 20 years and yanking them out and sending them home. That's, that is not a popular position. But that's different than citizenship. Totally different. Okay. But whatever you want to call it, amnesty or not amnesty, allowed to stay in the United States without, without suffering a penalty or deportation. If, if those are popular things, it will be very hard for the president's base to make him pay the price. And you know what he found out in December? 
He found out that working with the Republican establishment feels pretty good. It is like a warm jacuzzi that he slipped <laughs> in when you say, we, do we get tax cuts? Will everybody cheer when I get the tax cuts? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell has shown him how you can work your way to success. Steve Bannon is off talking about Thomas Cromwell and muttering into his soup someplace. Um, I like the jacuzzi really hot. Not I too feel hot. that. I, I do. They say it. it's bad for the skin, but so I really I do sweater. like it that so way. But you look on. nice and toasty tonight. <laughs> um, quickly, uh, the the thing, and you don't wear a sweater in the jacuzzi. No, no don't do it. Cold it is outside. Do You're still in swimsuit. Uh, okay, so what we got from the White House in the statement afterwards today was is this boils down to four things: DACA, right, border security, i.e., the wall, right, chain migration, and visa lottery. Those were the four things coming in anyway. So did the ball really move at all today on any of these negotiations? It moved in the larger sense about maybe doing comprehensive immigration reform at a certain point. But remember, there's only one thing that matters. That old government is going to shut down on the 19th mm. of January unless they do something. Democrats have vowed they will not vote for yep. any more kicking the can mm -hmm. unless they get some relief for these DACA kids. And the Republicans are saying, well, we can't do that unless we get some border security. So this is going to get, to, I think they have the what they will put in a spending deal already done, but fighting this down to the 19th is going to be some rough business. We'll be here because the funding runs out at midnight, midnight. and that's when and we're so, on. Yeah, it's so perfect. we'll be here. It's perfect. right before our Friday night dance party. Woo. Okay, uh, Chris Starwell, great to see you. Yes, ma'am. All right, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act became law just eight days ago, cutting the corporate tax rate from 35 down to 21 percent. Now, several major utility companies that will benefit from the lower taxes are passing along the savings to the consumers. Pacific Power, Rocky Mountain Power, and Washington's own Pepco are among the energy suppliers that have announced a plan to cut rates for hundreds of thousands of customers all across the nation. Well, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke is backing away from calls to drill off Florida's coast after meeting with the state's governor, Rick Scott. In a statement released tonight, Zinke said he, quote, supports the governor's position that Florida is unique and its coasts are heavily reliant on tourism as an economic driver. There's speculation Scott could mount a Senate bid against Democrat Bill Nelson in this year's midterms. Well, amid the first talks in years between North and South Korea, a report that the U.S. is planning to give Kim Jong-un a bloody nose. I think that's rhetorical. Trace Gallagher tells us what that means for Kim and for the talks. And what does Steve Bannon's latest fall from grace mean for the Trump revolution? Can the establishment claim victory? We'll debate that. But first, two big guests coming up. The head of the Border Patrol Union tells us whether he thinks we need a wall. And Congresswoman Martha McSally reportedly considering a run for Jeff Flake's Arizona Senate seat. And she is not the only one making news on that front. Controversial former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio says he is running for Senate, telling the Washington Examiner he has, quote, a lot to offer. Known for his immigration crackdowns, Arpaio said in a fundraising email that he's concerned about sanctuary city policies. He served as the sheriff of Maricopa County in Arizona for 24 years. You'll remember President Trump pardoned him last year for defying a judge's order that he stopped targeting and detaining Latino drivers on suspicion of being in the U.S. illegally. Arpaio is running to replace Senator Jeff Flake, who is retiring. Well, according to the Department of Homeland Security, border apprehension for the calendar year 2017 is down 40 percent from 2016. Despite the numbers, President Trump says we still need a border wall. But, you know, you, you speak to the agents, and I spoke to all of them. I spoke, I lived with them. They endorsed me for president, which they've never done before, the Border Patrol agents and ICE. They both endorsed Trump, and they never did that before. And I have a great relationship with them. They say, sir, without the wall, security doesn't work. We're all wasting time. Joining me now, Republican Congresswoman Martha McSally and Brandon Judd, the president of the National Border Patrol Council. Thank you both for being here tonight. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman, I'll start with you. You were in that meeting today. I was. Did... Was there real progress? Are you moving forward on anything? Well, I was uh, glad to be invited to the meeting, and I appreciate the president's leadership. Uh, we've got to address these issues, and uh, there's some clear priorities here of securing our border, uh, stopping illegal immigration, not incentivizing more in the future, uh, addressing and getting rid of chain migration, uh, the visa lottery, and actually we'll be introducing a bill tomorrow, there's four of us, that have many of these priorities that the president talked about today, uh, plus some additional ones. We've been working on this nonstop for about four months together, and we think this is a really strong conservative solution. And I appreciate that there seemed to be slight agreement, uh, some agreement by our, our Democrat counterparts there, 
uh, that we at least have four topics that we now need to negotiate. And this cannot just be addressing DACA or a Clean Dream Act. That's, that's a non-starter. Uh, I think most people are willing to have a conversation on DACA, but we've got to address the root causes of why we have 800,000 people here in the first place and make sure that we don't have that happen again in the future. And so these are common sense solutions that we've got to negotiate for the American people. And I know you're not convinced that a wall is the answer, at least not a 900 mile or plus wall as the president is so committed to. Um, a study from the Center for Immigration Studies says this, if a wall stopped half of those expected to successfully enter illegally without going through a port of entry at the southern border over the next 10 years, it would save taxpayers nearly $64 billion, several times the wall's cost. Why are you not well, convinced? I agree the with the president and I agree with Brandon here. We do need a border wall. We do need physical infrastructure and we've seen in my district that I, that I represent where we previously had no barriers and no fencing. It was a free-for-all. The cartels were just driving through anywhere. The ranchers and border residents were having to deal with it. And so there's some physical infrastructure there and it has caused a problem for the cartels to have to deal with. So that plus technology, agents, and everything that we need in order to stop the cartels is important. So we absolutely need a border wall and everything that goes with it in order to uh, keep our country safe. All right, Brandon, what would help you as uh, somebody who has worked on the front lines there? I know that you all are facing real dangers, assaults, I mean, threats to your um, physical body and well-being. Uh, how tough is it to retain, to hire people to join you there? I know the president and, and several of the uh, legislative fixes are dealing with giving you more personnel. We've had a difficult time retaining our employees because if you look at the past eight years, the good guys were being handcuffed, our agents were being handcuffed, and we were taking those handcuffs off the bad guys, and we were just letting them go. So anybody that crossed the border illegally, we would take them into custody, and then we would just turn around and let them go to where they would then disappear into the shadows of society. And so since we've uh, had a new president come in, and, and because he is tough on the laws and wants to enforce the laws the way they're written on the books, our agents are a heck of a lot happier, and, and we're, we're able to keep agents a little bit better, but we, we still have an awful lot of work to do there, but I think that we're going to get it done. And you've needed funding for that as well. I know there's been some talk about the mix of more Border Patrol agents versus Customs agents. Um, what would be most helpful, do you think, in actually securing the border? We need them both. Uh, when, you, when you look at Customs, Customs, they, they drive an awful lot of revenue in this country, and we cannot slow that revenue down. The Border Patrol agents that work between the ports of entry, like myself and some agents that are with me here today, we work between the ports of entry and we stop all of those things that are coming across illegally that, that people don't see. Um, and we both do an extremely important job, so you have to have a mixture of both. All right, so we hinted today at the news in Arizona as well. The Sheriff Arpaio is running. He says, I'm running uh, from the great state of Arizona for one unwavering reason to support the agenda and policies of President Donald Trump and his mission to make America great again. Of course, Congresswoman, there's a lot of speculation that you're going to toss your hat in the ring as well. Any comment on the sheriff's entry or your potential entry? Well, Shannon, you may know that uh, we do have an announcement coming on Friday. So I just ask you and your viewers, especially in Arizona, to stay tuned for that announcement. We will. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to jump in. Um, we're hoping, Border Patrol Agency in Arizona are hoping that Congresswoman McSally does, in fact, throw her hat into the ring. She's been extremely tough on border security. She wants border security and, and for that we we would support her okay so if, if you once you make it official uh, you got one vote at least right here and I think a couple more here in the in the studio as well um, thank you both for coming in and uh, keep us updated thank you. thank you all right recent wildfires in California giving way to fatal mudslides forcing people to run for their lives Anita Vogel has the story right after the break and President Trump responds to rumors of an Oprah run what he has to say about his potential political foe you know, I did one of her last shows. She had Donald Trump, this is before politics, her last week. And she had Donald Trump and my family. It was very nice. More environmental devastation hitting Southern California following last month's catastrophic wildfires. At least 13 people have been killed as heavy rains sent walls of mud sliding down charred hillsides. Anita Vogel has the story. Shannon, multiple casualties tonight after powerful storms brought flooding, mudslides, and sheer panic to communities just north of Los Angeles. The hardest hit area, the community of Montecito, just south of Santa Barbara. An enclave of multi-million dollar homes, including celebrities like Oprah Winfrey. The mountains above were hard hit in December by the Thomas Fire. Vegetation and brush were burned away by flames, so there wasn't much to absorb the water and the mud came cascading down the hillside. 
it sounded like a freight train coming down the hill. You know, you could hear these boulders rolling down. Yeah, the whole house was shaking. I panicked. I mean, I, I, they were both asleep, and I was in my boots, and I just said, there's mud in the driveway, there's mud in the driveway. Dozens of homes were flooded with mud. Firefighters had to pull people out in the middle of the night, including a 14-year-old girl who was stuck for hours. Others had to be rescued from their cars via helicopters. And at least three homes caught fire after a gas leak and transformer explosion. Authorities say only 15 to 20 percent of the 21,000 people told to evacuate followed orders, surprising and disappointing emergency responders. We have history of flooding in the area, uh, but with the fire, the ash, and then uh, little to no vegetation, uh, the sediment uh, just builds up quickly and it starts to clog uh, the, uh, the streams and, and that adds to the problem. Tonight, there are still many people without power and water and who are still cut off from their homes. The 101 freeway behind me remains closed from Ventura all the way to Santa Barbara and may be closed for days. And unfortunately, authorities say they expect the death toll will rise overnight. Shannon. Tough news there. Anita Vogel with a live report for us. Thank you. Last night, we took you to the start of the meetings between North and South Korea where officials were holding their first face-to-face -face talks in roughly two years. Today, according to a joint statement, the countries agreed that North Korea will send athletes to the Winter Olympics in South Korea, but still refuse to negotiate over their nuclear program. That means tensions are still bubbling. According to a report from the Wall Street Journal, U.S. officials are debating whether it's possible to launch a limited military strike against North Korea without starting an all-out war. Trace Gallagher has been following all of this from Los Angeles. Good evening, Trace. Good evening, Shannon. Breaking right now, we should note South Korean President Moon Jae-in says he is willing to meet with Kim Jong-un to resolve the North Korean nuclear standoff, but he says the success of the summit must be realized before the meeting takes place. So another small diplomatic step on the North Korean or the Korean Peninsula. Meantime, here in the United States, we're still working this Wall Street Journal report that U.S. officials are debating a possible limited military strike against North Korea. It's being referred to as the bloody nose strategy, meaning if North Korea was to make some provocation like testing a nuclear weapon, the U.S. could bloody its nose by mounting a surgical strike against a North Korea weapons facility without igniting an all-out war on the Korean Peninsula. The Washington Examiner says the Pentagon has little appetite for a limited strike because the risks are simply too high, saying the big flaw in the bloody nose strategy is that Kim Jong-un would have no way of knowing if the strike is truly limited. He may instead believe it's the opening blow in an effort to topple him from power. And in that case, he might respond with whatever weapons he has, which is a frightening scenario for South Korea, considering the North has a massive array of artillery pointed directly at Seoul. Experts say within minutes, North Korea could wipe out tens of thousands of South Koreans and could potentially even fire a nuclear weapon across the demilitarized zone. Even with reports that the bloody nose strategy is being debated inside the Trump administration, it appears Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis remain focused on trying to use a broader diplomatic effort to rein in North Korea's nuclear program. And we should note talks between North and South Korea are expected to move forward. Shannon. All right, Trace Gallagher for us in L.A., thank you. All right, where in the world? In about 90 seconds. The State Department appears to be on the brink of denying entry to the U.S. for 100 Christian Iranians stranded in Vienna. Their status was put in limbo at the end of the Obama administration, and activists worry the Trump administration might not grant them asylum, giving Austria little choice but to send them back to Iran. Scenes eerily reminiscent of the dawn of the Arab Spring hitting Tunisia tonight. At least one person killed in protests over price increases in Tunisia, the birthplace of the Arab Spring seven years ago. Then, as now, economic issues were what led to the upheaval that swept the Middle East. More looting in socialist Venezuela as the government orders supermarkets to lower prices. Shortages of food, medicine and basic goods have become dire amid moves by leftist strongman Nicolas Maduro to further consolidate power and clamp down on anti-government voices. An unusually heavy snowfall leaving tourists stranded in Swiss towns near the famed Matterhorn Mountain. 
Swiss emergency workers using helicopters trying to ferry out thousands of tourists to safety. And police cracking down on the mob tonight in Germany and Italy. More than 160 people busted, $60 million worth of assets seized. Suspects stand accused of mafia association, attempted murder, extortion, money laundering, and illegal weapons possessions, among other charges. And Prince Harry and his fiancée, Meghan Markle, going to a youth radio station today. They stood outside Pop Brixton while the crowd shouted, We love you, Meghan. Hmm. Well, with all the Oprah 2020 buzz following her stirring speech Sunday night at the Golden Globes, the president himself responded today on a possible race against Miss Winfrey. Mr. Trump says he knows Oprah well. He enjoyed being one of the guests on her final, one of her final talk shows. He says he doesn't think she's going to run, but if she does, he said, quote, yeah, I'll beat Oprah. Well, President Trump's lawyer filing a pair of lawsuits tonight against BuzzFeed and Fusion GPS over the now infamous Trump dossier. Reaction from House Intelligence Committee member Congressman Chris Stewart coming up and former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon is out at Breitbart after his public fallout with the president. More on that just ahead. This is a uh, Fox News alert on the so-called DACA program uh, for so-called dreamers, those hundreds of thousands of young immigrants whose legal status right now is up in the air, something they were negotiating over at the White House today because the president has said the program, which was instituted under the Obama administration, has got to go. Well, tonight, a judge in San Francisco is ruling that the DACA program must remain in place while litigation over President Trump's decision to rescind the program actually works its way through the courts. We'll see, I would imagine, an immediate appeal by the administration, but it just happened a short time ago, so we will wait and let you know how the administration responds when they decide. Now, as we reported earlier tonight, Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein released the full transcripts from Fusion GPS co-founder Glenn Simpson's Senate testimony. It was behind closed doors. Also tonight, President Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen, has filed a pair of lawsuits, one against the website BuzzFeed, that's in state court. The other suit is against Fusion GPS, that one's in federal court. Now, both of them are over the so-called dirty dossier with its unverified allegations on President Trump and his uh, associates' ties to Russia. Cohen's alleging the dossier, which BuzzFeed published, painted him as having a possibly criminal relationship with the Russian government. Here with instant reaction, all of these late breaking developments is Republican Congressman from Utah, Chris Stewart. He's also on the House Intelligence Committee, so he knows all about these things. Good to have you tonight. Good to be with you. Thank you. Okay, so where do we start? First of all, what do you make of this ruling out of San Francisco that this administration has to uphold the previous decision, administration's decision to institute DACA basically by executive order? Uh, you know, it's difficult. I think I'd just say this. These are decisions that are best made in the Congress. They're best made in the political body, not in the courts. I I think that's an uh, appropriate response, and hopefully that's where we end up. Okay. Secondly, we now have these two defamation lawsuits for Michael Cohen, uh, a lawyer for the president. They've been together many, many decades, many years working together. He says that BuzzFeed, uh, and also going after Fusion GPS, saying they knew this information was false, or they had to at least have some reckless uh, handling of the truth, because Cohen says they put me in countries and places I've never been, people I've never met. They should have at least checked this out. Um, he's going to court. Oh, no doubt about it. I'm glad that he is. So look, this is a private citizen. He, he hadn't thrust himself into the public realm. He's a private citizen doing his job, and they accused him not of jaywalking. They accused him essentially of treason. And I think he should defend himself. And the dossier we've been saying for a long, long time, in the last few weeks, I've asked members of the FBI, tell me anything in the dossier that's true. Uh, well, you know, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, that's their response. I don't know how to answer that question. This is a meaningful accusation, and I think any citizen has a, a right to defend himself against something so serious as that. What's your characterization, would you say, of the information you've been able to get from the FBI or the DOJ about the dossier, whether it was used to get the FISA warrant to spy on Carter Page or other members of the Trump administration? Have they been forthcoming? Not initially but you eventually just compel them to answer those questions. And I can't answer that question for you specifically, but we can speak generally, and that is we know that it was a very important piece of evidence they used to carry forward their investigation. We know that it's been disproven, and it's so important for the people to know that. Once again, ask members of the FBI, tell me anything in the dossier that's true. I don't know how to answer that question, or they'll answer very basic things that are very common knowledge. And these are innocent people who have been accused of very serious crimes and it's done in such a willy-nilly manner as if, as if the politics of it are the only thing that matter. These are people's lives that we're talking about here. Well, Glenn Simpson, who is a former Wall Street Journal uh, journalist and a co-founder of Fusion GPS, he has complained that he thinks that 
Uh, there have been leaks and mischaracterizations of his position and where he's been. He wrote a piece on that last week. Senate Judiciary Chairman uh, Chuck Grassley has said, we want you to come and testify. Yeah. You took the Fifth Amendment when we asked you to do that. Um, now, tonight, the top Democrat on that committee released today all of this, uh, the full transcript. She says this, the innuendo and misinformation circulating about the transcript are part of a deeply troubling effort to undermine the investigation into potential collusion and obstruction of justice. The only way to set the record straight is to make the transcript public. Um, Grassley says they didn't consult on that. Yeah. Uh, he would have consulted with her, but she's done it. I can't imagine what she hoped to accomplish by that. I really can't. And frankly, the accusation is just silly. I mean, look, a year ago, there were so many Democrats who really expected that this president would be impeached for collusion. And now after all of this time in this investigation, they're very, very frustrated that the evidence isn't pointing to that. So then they're left to this one other option that is, well, the investigation was therefore tainted or it's incomplete. We have, in we have interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of people, thousands of hours. Our report, which will be completed fairly soon, will be hundreds of pages long. But if the evidence of collusion is not there, maybe those people were innocent. But instead, their presumption is, well, the investigation is a failure or the people are trying to protect the president. It's just, it's just not true. And frankly, it's silly for her, I think, to have taken this unilaterally, to have taken this action. And I don't know what she hoped to accomplish by it. Um, really quickly, because we're out of time, but there's a Democratic strategist and activist out there who has said, basically, after reading this, you have to think that the GOP was covering um, for the president and for his associates. He says, members of Congress, GOP members, will go to jail. <laughs> Okay, well, I'd be willing to bet some money on that. I mean, I have no evidence of that at all. I don't think that he does. If he does, then please bring it forward to us. We'd love to see it because it's not something we've seen up at this point, that's for sure. All right, Congressman, thanks for coming in tonight and giving us an update. Uh, we know that the committee has a lot of work ahead, and uh, we'll look forward to the result. Thank you. All right, he apologized for not responding sooner to explosive quotes in a bombshell book about the Trump administration. Now Steve Bannon is leaving Breitbart News. What's next for the president's former chief strategist? Plus, residents in Utah say lesser prairie dogs are overrunning their town. We're going to tell you why and how the Supreme Court got involved with that story. Gone from the White House, now leaving his small but vocal perch, uh, media perch at Breitbart News. It's unclear where Steve Bannon goes next, but can President Trump's former chief strategist and anti-establishment ringleader continue to wield power? And what of the so-called Trump revolution? Is the establishment gaining the upper hand? Who better to ask than townhall.com political editor Guy Benson and syndicated radio host Richard Fowler. Both of them are Fox News contributors. And happy birthday to Richard and spending his final eight minutes of his birthday. <laughs> We love it. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. It's good to be here. Yeah, great to have you. Okay, so let's talk about exactly what's going on um, with Steve Bannon. Because he's in a lot of trouble now. He's lost key donors that he thought were going to align with him. He's outed Breitbart, and um, he's not in good graces with the president. This uh, piece in Washington Post, uh, Aaron Blake writes, what's particularly remarkable about Bannon's fall is how entirely Trumpian it was. From his perch in the White House, Bannon apparently felt invincible enough to spout off to Wolf about how that meeting Donald Trump Jr. had with a Russian lawyer was treasonous and about how Ivanka Trump was dumb as a brick. He didn't realize that saying such things about Trump's family might cause a problem or two is the biggest mystery. Guy, what? What? I don't understand what he's doing. Uh, neither do I. Uh, this was a self-immolation that was comprehensive and swift. It started with Roy Moore losing a race that no Republican really could lose except for Roy Moore. And uh, Trump went with the right guy in the primary. Bannon did not. And then just a few weeks later, months later, out comes this book where it's not just the nasty comments about the president's family. It's also tying the president himself into the Russia collusion narrative in a way that almost no one has been able to do. Here comes Steve Bannon with this wild speculation about that meeting at Trump Tower before he even got on the campaign. That is just crossing one bright line after the well, next. And so out at the White House, out as a close confidant of the president, now he's sloppy Steve, and Breitbart now kicks him <laughs> to the corner with his billionaire backers walking well, out as well. And apparently Richard, he was in there talking about running for president himself and uh, you know so we'll see about that i i we saw the tweet today from donna brazil who said this and grandmother if you're up watching i apologize for the salty language in advance uh steve bannon and i we both ended up pissing off a lot of people but i'll say this for myself at least i did it with my own book <laughs> right Ouch. way to dig the knife in uh miss brazil uh it's it, it's quite a fall from grace i think the the wise tale says the best pride cometh before the fall and for steve yes. bannon 
this was definitely a case of this. And I think what you're going to see over the next couple of days, you're going to see the White House try to posture and act like Steve Bannon wasn't a member of this White House. And I, I think what Democrats are going to try to do, or at least what we're going to try to do, is remind the American people that Steve Bannon was an integral part of this White House for the first, for the for a good chunk of this first year. Uh, and now he's sloppy Steve, and he's now out. And I think you know after a couple of really, really bad plays by Steve Bannon. He is no longer in the good graces of Donald Trump, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he was the chief strategist and he was one of the, the leading minds that got this president into the White House to begin right. with. Although what strikes me within the Republican political 